Tucked away in western Iowa, in Sioux City, the talk in late fall is usually about the harvest and whose high school football team is going to make state. But tonight, the city is the focal point for political power in the country. Who wins in November could determine the balance of power in Washington, D.C. Relative newcomer, Republican Joni Ernst, who's taken Iowa by storm with strong backing from the Republican Party. I am honored, and I do truly hope to have the opportunity to fight the good fight. Democrat Bruce Braley, a sitting congressman and lawyer, anointed by the Democratic Party to take over for longtime Senator Tom Harkin. I've worked with Republicans to pass important legislation that helps Iowa farmers, Iowa veterans. A race so important, the heavy hitters in each party are campaigning across Iowa. What you're about to watch next could set our country up with one party setting the political agenda for years to come. Now, your local election headquarters presents the final Senate debate. Welcome to beautiful Sioux City, Iowa. We are live this evening at Epley Auditorium on the campus of Morningside College, home tonight to the final Senate debate in the race that will determine who fills the shoes of long-term Iowa Senator Tom Harkin. Good evening again. I'm Tim Seaman. I'm anchor at KCAU-TV here in Sioux City. And I'm Amanda Krenz, chief political reporter for WOI-TV in Des Moines. Candidates, welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you, you for being here tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Pleasure. To our left is Congressman Bruce Braley from Brooklyn, Iowa, and to my right, State Senator Joni Ernst from Red Oak, Iowa. Again, thanks for being with us. Thank you. And as you can see, this debate is not like the others that you have watched. The candidates have previously taken part in two more traditional style debates. Tonight, we're throwing out tradition. That's right. There's uh, no lecterns tonight. There's no stilted questions from across the room. Just plain talk and some honest questions. That's right. Now to some basic rules for the evening. There will be no opening statements. Each candidate will have one minute to answer the questions. Their opponent will then be given 45 seconds for rebuttal. There will be a 90 second closing statement. And out of respect for the candidates, the audience has been asked to hold their applause until the end of the debate. Before we get started tonight, we want to ask you to join us and to participate by going to Twitter. You can tweet us your observations and opinions. Tell us if you think the candidates are answering what we're asking or if they're finding an artful way to avoid that question. You can use the hashtag Iowa debate to participate in the conversation tonight. And we did have a coin toss several days ago to determine who would be asking, get asked the first individual question. And Congressman Braley, you will have the first question. So let's jump right in and let's start with your resume tonight. You're 56 years old. You've been in Congress for eight years. Sites that track congressional voting records characterize you as a rank and file Democrat, one that usually, uh, usually uh, goes right along party lines for the most part. You have successfully authored and passed one bill during your time in Congress. So I guess tonight the first question would be, tell us what else is on your resume that will assure Iowa voters that you are the person that should fill Senator Harkin's shoes. Well, Tim, I want to begin by honoring the memory of Dr. Doug Butzier, who dedicated his life to serving others and died tragically this week. And my thoughts and prayers go out to his wife and his family. But I want to thank KCAU and Morningside College for hosting us tonight. And I want to thank Senator Ernst for joining me. Uh, but most importantly, I want to thank my wife, Carolyn, who taught today at West High in Waterloo and surprised me by joining us here tonight. You know, Tim, I've introduced and passed a lot more than one bill. I've worked with Republicans to pass legislation that's benefited Iowa. The very first bill that I introduced was a job training bill in biofuels that let community colleges train people for careers in Iowa's growing biofuels industry. I passed legislation by working with Republicans from Georgia to help benefit one of Iowa's leading manufacturers and keep jobs in Iowa. And I passed legislation to help hire unemployed veterans and to allow veterans to stay in their homes. So my record has been one of helping and serving the people of Iowa. Thank you. State Senator Ernst, let's take a look at your resume now. You are 44 years old, you've been a county auditor, and you are currently a lieutenant colonel in the National Guard, and a state senator since 2010. The heat gets turned up when you walk into Washington. The stakes are higher. Our senators are faced with critical national and international crisis decisions every day. So why should voters consider someone with your limited legislative resume for such an important leadership position? Yes, thank you. First. 
first, I would like to thank uh, our host this evening and for the opportunity to be here, Congressman. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, I also do want to extend my heartfelt prayers out to uh, Dr. Boutsier's family. Uh, what a tragic incident. We do have a number of, of really overwhelming uh, things going on around our world, not just domestically, but also internationally. And the way I describe myself as I'm out traveling across to Iowa is that I am an average Iowan who has had some extraordinary opportunities. I have served my local community, I've served my state, and I've served my nation. And we are facing a crisis in the Middle East, and so I do believe I am a credible candidate when it comes to dealing with those issues. I have had my boots on ground leading Iowa troops in Iraq and Kuwait, and will always stand up for our servicemen and women. Thank you. Something that we could have never really anticipated when this campaign began is now certainly at the forefront of everyone's minds. And of course, we're talking about the Ebola virus now. It's uh, spreading around the world. And of course, right here in America, voters are very concerned. And at this time, we'd like you to direct your attention to the monitors. Hi, my name is Don Lighting from Sioux City, Iowa. My question is, we have now seen two Ebola patients be treated just down the road in Omaha, Nebraska. What steps should the federal government be taking to protect me and my family? And Mr. Braley, we'll start with you here. I know you've just returned back from Washington where you spent some time today in an emergency meeting to discuss the country's response to Ebola. What can you tell us tonight that was discussed today? What happened today? Well, Don, what happened today is there was plain talk and honest questions to the heads of the, pe of the agencies that are dealing with the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institutes for Health, uh, the Customs and Border Patrol Agency, and I asked tough questions there and demanded answers answers on what we're doing to protect the safety and security of the American people. And what I found is that we need to do whatever is necessary to make that happen. If that means putting travel bans on and it protects the American people, we need to consider doing that. If it means beefing up travel restrictions, we need to do that. And if it means changing the hospital protocol so that patients in Omaha and Dallas and in Atlanta are being taken care of and are, we're solving the problem, we need to do that. But it was important for me to be that, at that hearing because one of the leading companies in the United States developing vaccines for Ebola is New Link Genetics in Ames, Iowa. And I had a chance to talk with some of their employees before that hearing and they're developing a vaccine that's in clinical trials right now. Mr. Ernst, would you like a rebuttal? Uh, yes, uh, this is a tragic disease that is sweeping through Western Africa, and we have seen it now on our on our own shores. And as a mother, to see families that are experiencing this, it is it is devastating. So I do believe that we need to do more. And unfortunately, our administration, um, including Congressman Braley, has been very reactive rather than proactive. We have seen the threat from Ebola for the past several months. And I would encourage temporary travel bans, additional screenings for travelers, continuing aid into those nations, but also supporting those that are researching and coming up with cures and prevention. Well, Tim, I have to respond to that because one of the things that Senator Ernst has made clear is she supported a radical plan to shut down the federal government, said she would have voted for it, and we learned today that that dramatically cut the funding for the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes for Health. And it also dramatically cut foreign aid. So you can't say that you support those things when your policies that you're promoting would have made it more difficult for us to address this problem. That's why I pressed the Health and Human Services to get these contracts awarded to New Link Genetics so that they can get this vaccine tested, get it in clinical trials in Africa, which they're preparing to do, make this vaccine widely available and commercially feasible so that we can protect everyone, people in the United States, people in West Africa. That's what American innovation is all about. Quickly. 
Yes, this is again a, a huge tragedy out there. But again, we are seeing failed leadership coming from the congressman, from President Obama. We have seen the threat from Ebola for the past several months, and only today did they call a hearing to address the lack of leadership within the departments out there. We should have moved this up. We should have been looking at travel bans much earlier than this before it ever came onto American shores. Tim. That hearing was called by the Republican leadership in the House Oversight and Investigations Committee. They were the ones that scheduled it, and that's why I made the trip out there today to be involved, to be able to get some plain talk and honest questions. And I would say, Last I night. would say, yes, that I released a statement about Ebola uh, before the congressman did, and he sits on this important committee. He could have been pushing for this a number of months ago, and yet again, we have seen failed leadership coming from the administration. Thank, Thank you, you, both of you. We're going to move on to our next topic, which is a sensitive one. But it's a very important issue that needs to be discussed. When it comes to abortion and contraception, you both have different points of view. And we're hoping to get some clarity on your positions tonight. Ms. Ernst, we're going to start with you. We're going to take this slowly. We're going to go through several points. We're going to talk with both of you first, and then we'll have a chance for responses. You co-sponsored what's been called the personhood amendment to the Iowa Constitution, meaning that a fertilized egg would be considered a person. And here's the key line of that amendment. The inalienable right to life of every person at any stage of development shall be recognized and protected. Now, this never passed, but it did open the door to your critics to suggest your support of this amendment means that you want to ban all abortions, certain types of contraception, and that you would be against in vitro fertilization. So again, we know there's a lot here. We're going to give you a chance to be very clear on your positions for the voters. We're going to go through each of these points one at a time. Just looking for short answers here first. Do you believe that life begins at conception? I do believe that, but I would like to respond um, to to all of that, though. Um, I do believe in supporting life, and I believe that the United States and the state of Iowa, uh, we do support life. I would... I do want to believe that. Uh, I do support life at conception, and I will always support life. And this is a very, very uh, sensitive issue, as you stated. And so we do have to have civil discussions when it comes to this very issue. I will always support life. But this is where we, as Republicans and Democrats, need to come together to find those areas that we agree on when supporting life. And there is an area which is, uh, we have done this in the past, where Democrats and Republicans came together to ban partial birth abortion. Harry Reid, uh, Joe Biden, they are Democrats supported that. But Congressman Braley doesn't even agree to that life-saving um, method, preventing partial birth abortions. Senator Ernst, we're going to get to some specifics here. Should all abortions be banned, or are there any exceptions? No. No, there, there would be certain exceptions, but again, it's something that, that has to be discussed. I support life. Um, those things come together when there is consensus upon what is put into legislation. Right now, there is not consensus, but I do believe in supporting life. You did say there are some exceptions. What would those be? Well, again, I support life. So um, going back to perhaps the life of the mother, I think that would be important. But again, civil discussion needs to happen. Let's move on to contraception. Would you consider banning any specific form of contraception? No, and this is where I have stood up and I have said over and over again that I do support a woman's right to accessible, reliable, and safe contraception. Now, the congressman has made many misstatements about this, run many ads, and those have been rated false by the Washington Post. He was given many, many uh, Pinocchios on this issue. And I find it rather disconcerting that me, I'm a woman, I'm a mother of three daughters, to be lectured on these issues of contraception is, is laughable. 
and we're going to get to the congressman in a moment. One more question in regard to in vitro fertilization. Because the fertilized eggs may eventually be destroyed, do you feel that in vitro fertilization should be banned? I have a dear, dear friend who has two beautiful daughters because of in vitro fertilization, and I am glad that she is blessed to be a mother. Okay. Congressman Braley, we're going to move on to a series of questions for you, and then you'll both get a chance for a rebuttal, okay? Mr. Braley, we would like to ask you to please be specific with your answers as well. At what point during fetal development do you believe a woman should not have an abortion? I have always stated, contrary to what Senator Ernst said, that I oppose all late-term abortions that aren't necessary to save the life or health of a mother. And by late-term, can you be specific? Well, it's a term that has a specific legal meaning because of existing law and when the rights of the mother and the rights of the child have significance in terms of deciding. Okay. Do you support employers selecting the types of contraception that they're willing to provide under their insurance plans? No, not at all. And Senator Ernst made the blanket statement that uh, she supports a woman's right to contraception, and yet she supports a Supreme Court decision that allows employers to interfere with an individual woman's health care decisions about her contraception. And she has voted in the Iowa Senate, Senate to limit women's access to contraception, and she wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which would provide, uh, which would increase the cost for contraception for most Iowa women by $600 a year. Congressman, do you support life? I do support life. According to PolitiFact, experts looked at the personhood amendment and concluded that it's too ambiguous to predict its legal ramifications since abortion is currently federally protected through Roe v. Wade. So, does it matter that Mr. Ernst supports life because this is already a decided issue and all the criticisms don't mean anything? No. Why else would the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, which takes care of pregnant mothers and babies, say that the things that are in the personhood amendment would do all the things that I have just said? It would outlaw all forms of abortion, including in the case of rape or incest, and to save the life of a mother. It would interfere with in vitro fertilization procedures. And Senator Ernst herself had said that under her personhood amendment, doctors should be prosecuted who perform legal medical procedures today. A chance now for both of you to rebuttal. We'll start with you. Yes. Now, again, mischaracterizing my position, especially when it comes to birth control, I will always protect a woman's right to access for affordable, safe, and reliable birth control. Now, I agree with the Supreme Court ruling, but that doesn't mean a woman can't uh, get reliable, safe birth control. Uh, she can still go to her doctor and receive birth control. It's not outlawed birth control. So again, this is a ploy to scare women, and we shouldn't be doing that. I will protect their right to access to birth control. So um, let's make that clear. Uh, when it comes to deciding uh, whether uh, there is, is life, you've, all, you've just said that it's determined by law. So again, there has to be consensus on these issues. And where there is not consensus, there will not be a law. Thank you. Well, Senator Ernst, your words have consequences. And you can't say that you protect a woman's right to contraception and then vote against it on the Senate floor. You can't say that you want to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which provides free contraceptive services to women, and increase their costs by $600. And you can't say that you support that right and then say it's okay for employers to interfere with it. Your words have consequences. They'll raise the cost for contraception and to some women, that cost will prohibit them from getting the contraceptive services that they need. And I think we need to jump yeah. in right now. We can go back and forth <laughs> and back and forth, appreciate both sides here. And we'll move ahead to another health care issue. Let's do that. Let's talk about health care. The Affordable Care Act, or as both sides commonly refer to it, Obamacare, will soon be enrolling uh, participants. We're in second year now. Mr. Ernst, you've made it pretty uh, clear your position is to get rid of Obamacare, to repeal it. According to healthcare.gov, in Iowa under Obamacare, 20,000 adults under the age of 26 were added to parents' insurance plans. 1.2 million Iowans now cannot be discriminated against for having pre-existing conditions. And Medicaid patients have saved more than $120 million on prescription drugs. So sitting here tonight, Ms. Ernst, let us know 
Iowans that have these benefits, that have come to rely on them, and knowing how hard it is to get any kind of legislation passed in Washington, can you explain to people why they need to give these benefits up now? Certainly. Every Iowan and every American deserves to have affordable, quality health care. But Obamacare is not the answer, and I will tell you why. Obamacare is a job killer, and we have seen that here in Iowa. It is a massive tax increase, $1.2 trillion over the next 10 years for the American people. And it takes our health care decisions out of our hands, out of our doctors' hands, and places them in the hands of nameless, faceless bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. So I don't support Obamacare. However, However, the congressman has voted for Obamacare and continues to defend it today. Now, he promised us that Obamacare would lower health care costs. It has not. We heard just last week that health care policies, their cost is going up an average of 19 percent. So he was wrong. He said we could keep our policies and that we could keep our doctors. He was wrong on that issue also. Why is it a job killer? It is a job killer because what we are seeing, and I've heard from Iowans all across the state, there are businesses now that are right around that 50 employee um, mandate of being a big business and so what they're trying to do they've evaluated the cost to their businesses and they can't afford to pay for these types of plans under the Affordable Care Act so what they're doing is lowering the number of full-time employees that they have they're not expanding their businesses we have seen a loss of jobs here in Sioux City Blue Cross Blue Shield laid off over a hundred employees and they attributed it directly to Obamacare so what would you do to make Make sure that doesn't happen. To make sure it doesn't happen first, I would repeal and replace Obamacare with patient-centered health care that does address pre-existing conditions. You mentioned having children on their parents' policies. We already had that here in the state of Iowa before Obamacare was enacted. So I believe we should allow um, insurance providers to sell over state lines, uh, tax credits for those that privately purchase insurance, allowing our small businesses to pool together their policies, just as we already allow large businesses to do. But again, we must make sure they address pre-existing conditions, and it must be affordable and work for Iowa families. Mr. Braley, a quick rebuttal before we give you a chance to well, answer Senator, a question directly. Well, Senator, sound bites have consequences, and when you say that every Iowan deserves affordable quality health care, there were 47 million Americans who didn't have access to quality affordable health care before the affordable Care Act became law. And it's not perfect, but we need to fix it and improve it instead of doing what you would do, which is vote 50 times to repeal it that doesn't do anything to make it better. I voted to allow people to stay on policies for two years. I made it simpler for small businesses facing the heavy uh, burden of paperwork, but we can't go back to where we were. Tim, I had a two-year-old nephew diagnosed with liver cancer. He's one of those children with a pre-existing condition who was affected by being unable to get coverage because of his pre-existing condition. That no longer is the case. That's why the statistics you cited are important to Iowans because it's making their lives better. You mentioned that it was flawed, so give me a couple quick specific points that are flawed that you'll change. I, I just I gave you some examples of things we already have changed, but one of the biggest flaws that I've been working very hard on with Iowa doctors and Iowa hospitals is a flaw in the reimbursement formula that penalizes great doctors and hospitals in Iowa who do great work and get quality patient outcomes, but don't get paid as much as doctors and hospitals in other parts of the country. That's why during the debate on the Affordable Care Act, I was their champion to make sure that they were getting fair pay and that we move to a system that rewards quality patient outcomes. That's where health care uh, reimbursement is heading. And you pointed out that 100,000 Iowans now have coverage because I worked with Governor Branstead to expand access to Medicaid, and you talked about the enormous 
positive impact that's having on Iowans who had no health insurance. Thank you. Thank you. We've talked so far. May I address quick, quick some response. of that? Yes. Also, under Obamacare, there are still 31 million Americans that will not have health care. Now, the congressman has stated costs will not go up, but we are seeing heavy increased costs because of the policy cancellations. You stated just a few years back that you would not change a thing about Obamacare, and yet today you're saying, ooh, yeah, we do need to make some changes to the bill. You said you read every page of this bill. You tabbed it. You highlighted it. So either you didn't understand what was in the bill or you were misleading Iowans. And I don't know which one is worse. Thank you. And we're going to well, move ahead please, once again. I can't allow that to go unanswered because it's not true. The and reality is that when you pass a huge change in how health care is delivered to millions of Americans, there are bound to be some things that you have to deal with along the way. That that's what we've done, repealing the entire bill and taking health care away from millions of Americans and adding costs. Uh, premiums will go up 225% in Iowa if you eliminate what's in place right now. That's not a good thing. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you both. We Thank are going to go ahead and move on Thank right you both. now. We've talked a lot tonight so far about some heavy and important issues, and we know that both of you can talk about where you stand on the political landscape. But only a fraction of the folks that will uh, ever be out there that you'll be representing on a daily basis get the chance to actually come up to you, ask you a question face to face, get to know you personally. So we want to ask you tonight uh, one quality that you possess that makes you unique. And Mr. Braley, we'll start with you. What is it that sets you apart? I'm a bridge builder, not a bridge burner. I spent a lot of my time getting to know the people that I serve with in Congress, Republicans and Democrats. I have them over for dinner, so I get to know where they came from. I get to learn about their families, the work they did before they came to Congress. And that's why I've had so much success working with Republicans to pass legislation that's been beneficial to Iowans. When the Iowa National Guard came home from Iraq and was denied benefits for G GI Bill benefits and hardship pay by the Pentagon, I worked with Republicans from Minnesota to get their orders changed so they got paid the benefits they deserved. When I had a constituent named Andrew Connolly who was denied a VA adaptability grant, I helped him to get that so he could stay in his home. Then I had him come to Washington and testify in front of the Veterans Affairs Committee and introduced a bill so that other veterans would have those same benefits because the program was going to expire. That that's what Iowans expect from their senator. Somebody like Senator Grassley and Senator Harkin who can bring people together, not drive them apart. Yeah. Mr. Ernst, let's turn to you. What unique thing is there about you that sets you apart tonight? I would say that I am a public servant. Again, I have served in my community, I've served my state, and I've served my nation in many different capacities. Work with many volunteer organizations at the community level, and I still serve as a Sunday school and confirmation teacher in the church that I grew up been. So I remain committed to my hometown and my home communities, but I've also served my state and my nation in the Army Reserves and the Iowa Army National Guard, and I don't do these things for personal gain. I do them because I believe in serving the public, whether it's a time of flood in eastern or western Iowa, whether it's during winter storms, making sure that Iowans are safe is important, but I've also served overseas. Uh, during a time of war in, in combat in Kuwait and Iraq. I, I believe that that is important. But sound bites do have consequences, and I believe that I have a pure heart and willing to serve Iowans, where Congressman Braley, behind closed doors, has poked fun at our senior senator, Chuck Grassley. I don't call that building bridges. I would say that's burning bridges, Congressman. Thank senator you. We're going to go ahead and move on. We have a couple of questions here. Again, we want to get to know knows you. I didn't poke fun at Senator Grassley. Grassley, and she knows that I talked to him that same day and apologized to him, and I apologized to Iowa farmers because that's what people expect Iowans to do. So if you're questioning my pure heart, Senator, I can tell you that I've been an elder in my church. I've taught Sunday school to adults and children. I've never seen a corporation sitting next to me in the church pew, and yet you believe that their interests outweigh those of women in Iowa when it comes to contraception. 
Oh, again, very misleading. I have said I will support a woman's right to contraception. But what you say behind those closed doors really does matter to Iowans. And maybe you did apologize to Chuck Grassley. But my father is a farmer also without a law degree. And I think he's done very well. And again, I contribute to my, my community, my state, and my nation. And I am ready to serve the people of Iowa. Well, Thank and you if both. you want to talk about what we're, goes we're gonna, on behind closed doors, tell us about the meeting you had. We're, we're, we're going to go ahead and jump in now. And right. ahead. We have a couple other lighter things we want to talk about before we get heavy again. So, Amanda, go ahead. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. These are meant to be a little more lighthearted because we do just want the voters to get a chance to know you guys a little bit better. So nothing difficult here. Quick answers. Ms. Ernst, we're going to start with you on this one. Thanks. Who do you cheer for on Saturdays? Iowa or Iowa State? I am an Iowa State cyclone uh, as long as they are not playing each other. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Congressman Braley, same question. On Saturdays, who do you cheer for? Iowa or Iowa State? Well, as you know, I graduated from both fine universities, and when they play each other, I cheer for Iowa State. Okay, thank Mr. you. Mr. Braley, I've got a question for you here. Say something that uh, you can say something that, uh, that you admire, admire about your opponent. Tell us something you admire about Ms. Ernst. Well, I admire the fact that Senator Ernst has served our nation and our state and the Iowa National Guard. I think it's a terrific attribute. My father was a World War II combat veteran, and I have great respect for Senator Ernst for serving our country. Thank you. And the same to you. And I think Congressman Braley is a great father. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you both for that. Let's move ahead. Uh, now to something, we've said something nice, I guess, here, so maybe we turn the page and we go the other direction just a little bit. We have to bring something up that uh, voters feel very strongly about. Iowans view this race as one of the nastiest, one of the uh, ugliest that they've seen in history. The Center for Public Integrity says $17.8 million has been spent on TV advertising, and that's only through October 1st, and it will easily near $20 million or more before this election is done. You'd obviously have to be living under a rock or just don't own a TV to know that these commercials haven't been airing. We asked our viewers to send us questions for you tonight through social media. Many of them are angered, as you might guess, even disgusted about all of the negative advertising. One of them is Scott Brzezinski from Cedar Rapids, and he said, what ad on your behalf has embarrassed you most? So, Congressman Braley, Senator Ernst, run on your behalf. Which one would it be? And we'll start with Mr. Braley. Well, it wasn't run on my behalf, but it was an ad that was run earlier in the race that showed a bunch of people looking into this box. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a horrible ad. I thought that it was uh, not an effective way to talk about the very real differences between us in this race. But Tim, I'm the only candidate in this race who has voted to try to limit the influence of these outside groups, most of whom are funded by secret donors that the public doesn't know who's paying for the ads. When Senator Ernst and I put an ad up on television, we have to tell who our donors are. We have to tell how we spend the money. But because of a Supreme Court decision that I think is one of the biggest threats to democracy there is, there is an unlimited ability of outside groups to say whatever they want, to distort our record, and I think that's wrong. That's why I called during the last debate for Senator Ernst to join me in encouraging all these outside groups to take down their ads and to make sure that we know who the donors are who are behind these ads. Ms. Ernst, the Rebuttal. Yes, um, and thank you, Scott, for that question. This has been a very, very negative campaign, and it started the very day after the primary in June. The day after I won the Republican nomination, there was an ad that was paid for by Congressman Braley's committee that compared me to a baby chick. Um, I didn't appreciate that ad. I would have to say ads run on my behalf. I really don't know because I don't watch television any longer. Um, I don't pay attention to those ads because I have been so heavily outspent from the outside with all of these negative ads. My husband and daughter don't watch television anymore. It is very disheartening. When you have a failed rest, uh, record in Washington, D.C., you have to tear down your opponent, and that's what the Democrats are trying to do in this race. You don't watch TV these days. I don't watch TV. Okay, I do have. I want, I want to ask one more thing to both of you as well. You've mentioned some of that outside influence. At the end of those commercials, it says not endorsed by the candidate or the candidate's committee. Is it time that it says endorsed by? 
Should no. that be there? Tim, it's time to get secret money donors out of politics, period. That's what needs to happen so that it's a focus on the differences in issues between the candidates, which, as you can tell tonight, are very clear. I, I'm just like you, Senator Ernst. My family and I don't watch TV anymore. Because but what are you going to do about it then? How do you step up and make that happen? It's not what I will do, it's what I've already done. I'm the only one here tonight running for the Senate who has voted to limit the influence of these outside groups. I voted for the Disclose Act, which would require transparency and the disclosure of donors who are paying for these ads. So while we're there, let me turn to you. Yes. What would you do then, Ms. Ernst? Well, I do believe in political free speech, and this is a way that individuals are exercising their political free speech. That's a first step amendment right. So whether we like it or whether we don't, and I don't, uh, again, I'm being heavily outspent by outside interests in this race. I don't like it, but I do believe in standing up for our citizens' rights, and that is a right that they have. Senator Ernst, you know that you're not being heavily outspent by outside interests, and the big difference between us on this issue is that I'm willing to say to those outside interests, you have have to come clean and take your ads down. That's the big difference between us in this case. These outside groups are lying about my record. They're doing it to distract from the real issues. I'm here standing up for everyone in this room who is sick and tired of these ads saying, I will work because the political free speech of secret donors is not more important than the political free speech of Iowans. That's why if you elect me, I will work for reasonable campaign finance reform that gives everyone's political voice the same clout. It shouldn't be secret donors like the Koch brothers who are spending more money to buy your vote than people who want to know where you stand on the we're, issue. We're gonna, we're gonna, Again, very though, quickly. Um, I am being mischaracterized in so many of the ads that are coming from the other side. And yes, I have been outside or coming from outside money outspent by about $2 million. That's a lot of money in Iowa airtime. It is really hard to combat that. Um, you have earned... Uh, Pinocchio's and through PolitiFact check, uh, there have been several different issues. One is the birth control issue. The other is Social Security, where I have been mischaracterized on those issues. Let's but talk about Social Security Let's, right jump, let's jump right there. Let's go. Thank you, I think. So the Social Security Trust Fund, under current conditions, will run out in 19 years, mm -hmm. in the year 2033. Neither of you has officially supported raising the retirement age. We know Social Security isn't going to be solvent if it continues the way that it's going right now. Mr. Ernst, you said that you want to look at options for fixing the system with no specifics, though. And Mr. Braley, you've said that you have a four-point plan that lacks some details. So we think it's time for someone to step up and lead on this issue. Mr. Braley, we're going to start with you. Again, we know you have your four-point plan. You've used phrases like, let's grow the economy. That seems pretty vague. So please name one fundamental change that you would support to keep the Social Security program solvent. Amanda, I mentioned this during the b debate in Davenport on Saturday night. I think that millionaires and billionaires should be paying the same portion of their earned un income into Social Security as hardworking Iowans in the middle class. And they're not right now. And so my plan would require them to do that and it would dramatically increase the amount of money in the Social Security Trust Fund, and it would actually increase benefits for seniors. But I also believe we need to increase the minimum wage, give up, give 300,000 Iowans a pay raise, and it would put billions each year in addition into the Social Security and Med Medicare Trust Fund. And what we also need to do, as I've said, is we need to grow our economy. And the ways we can do that is by investing in our crumbling infrastructure for every billion dollars we invest, it creates 25,000 new jobs, and those workers will pay into Social Security's trust fund. And those are concrete, tangible things we can do to make Social Security solvent going forward. Thank you. Ms. Ernst, you said that you're open to any options. At some point, you have to stand up and say, I'm at least for one thing. So what is your one 
fundamental change that you would support to keep the Social Security program Thank solid? You, Amanda. I will always stand up and fight for Social Security and Medicare for our Iowa seniors, just like my mom and dad. We have over 600,000 Iowans that rely on Social Security, and we have made those sacred promises to those individuals. So we must stand by those promises. However, we have to recognize that there is a problem. And this system will run out of money within 20 years before I can even retire. But any solutions that we come to, they must not affect the benefits of those that are retired and those that are nearing retirement. We must keep those promises. Uh, so one solution that I would state we could do, or one option, would be bringing in new state and local workers that are not currently engaged in the Social Security system, bringing them in. However, the congressman has stated raising the minimum wage, that would eliminate up to 20,000 jobs here in the state of Iowa, 500,000 jobs nationwide. I don't see that that is a solution. Thank you, Senator. About a month ago, President Obama hoped that a high-powered air attack would help degrade and destroy ISIS, another important issue tonight we want to get to. Despite that, though, the Islamic terror group continues to capture more territory. They continue to move forward, and voters that we've talked with have renewed concerns. We'd like to look at the monitor again. You're done. My name is Adam Veldi. I live in Cumming, Iowa. I served in the United States Army from 1996 to 2000. My question is, you both say that you support the U.S. troops and you agree that we need to defeat ISIS. And my question is, how do you suppose we do that? Do you both support putting troops in the Middle East again? Mr. Braley, we'll start with you. What do you say to Mr. Veldi tonight? Well, the first thing I say to Adam is, Adam, thank you for serving us in the Army. I noticed that you're from Senator Harkin's hometown of Cumming, Iowa. And when I was in Washington, D.C. today, I got an updated classified briefing on what's going on with ISIS. And some of the questions I asked were, what's the current troop strength of the Iraqi Defense Forces? because they have been significantly degraded as a result of what's happening. What is the status of the new government of, in Iraq? Because it, it's absolutely critical to any success against ISIS. And I voted uh, with my Republican colleagues overwhelmingly to give the president limited authority to arm moderate Syrian rebels to coordinate with our airstrikes that are going on. And I also got an update today on what our allies in the region and around the globe are willing to commit to try to address this terrorist threat. But ISIS is a threat that must be destroyed. And that's why we need to make sure that we're working to make sure that they are eliminated because they need to be brought to justice or to the grave, period. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ernst, would you like to rebuttal there? Yes, ISIS does need to be destroyed. They are extreme terrorists, and we have seen this threat for actually a number of years now and his, as it has grown in strength. Before we commit to any military action, and we are engaging in that now, I have several criteria that I would need to evaluate. The first is, do we have actionable intelligence which outlines the threat, and can we be successful in combating that threat. Second is, do we have a clearly defined mission? And will we put the resources forward necessary to support that mission? And last is, once we've achieved that mission, do we have a withdrawal plan? And will we be caring for our men and women and their families upon their return? Now, the congressman, I'm not sure where he stands on this issue, because in June, after Mosul fell to ISIS, he voted for no combat funding in Iraq, yet today he's stating that he would support actions. I'm not sure where he stands. And before we give him a chance, I want to follow up. What exactly would be actionable intelligence for you? What would that be in terms that we can grasp? You bet. It would be intelligence that shows that there is a threat to our national interests or to our safety as Americans. National interests could include infrastructure, um, our allies in the region, any of those threats that have been laid out and show that we would be impacted as Americans. Mr. Braley? Senator Ernst knows that the vote she's referring to had nothing to do with action against ISIS. In fact, that's why 23 Republican members of the House 
joined me in making sure that before the president committed boots on the ground in Iraq, he had to come to Congress and get authority to do that. Because the truth is, we can't continue to be the world's police force. Secretary Gates, in his last address at West Point, said, for any future defense secretary to advise an American president to a large-scale land war in the Middle East, they ought to have their head examined. That's why I agree with Senator Ernst on the three criteria that she says must be met to commit U.S. forces, but the thing she left out, you also have to make the case to the American people on why that investment of treasure and blood is necessary, and that hasn't been done yet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I believe that has done. I think there is overwhelming support coming from the American people on dealing with the threat of ISIS. Now, going back, this is again another issue that our president, the administration, and Congressman Braley has been reactive rather than proactive. We know the president didn't leave troops on ground uh, following uh, the closing of the Iraqi campaign because even against his senior military advisors, his own Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, advised that we keep troops on ground. And I know that the congressman twice voted to defund our men and women as they were serving in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. Senator but, Ernst knows that last statement is not response, true please. because she knows that I voted to end a decade-long commitment of U.S. ground troops in Iraq. She knows it was the Prime Minister al-Maliki, who refused to enter into a status of forces agreement to keep troops on the ground. Are you saying tonight that you are prepared to commit U.S. forces on the ground in Iraq to deal with this threat and in Syria? Is that what you're suggesting President Obama should have done? I am stating that I would have to use the criteria that I have laid out before committing America's sons and daughters. And I will remind you that I have served in Iraq. My boots were on that ground that is now held by ISIS. So when we make these decisions, I take them very seriously. So before I would commit our sons and daughters, I would sort through those criteria. But we have to recognize that this is a threat that has been out there for years, and we have an administration that has refused to acknowledge that this is a, a group that is killing innocent civilians, Christians, and even Americans. Thank we need you. to deal with this threat. Thank you. We're going to turn now to immigration issues. Right now, the federal government and all government contractors must use the E-Verify system when they hire someone. Mm -hmm. This is an internet-based system that identifies if a person is legally eligible to be hired. And it's more than 90% accurate. But private businesses are not mandated to use it. By requiring all businesses to use E-Verify, you potentially could stop any undocumented workers from being hired. So, would you support a bill requiring all businesses to use E-Verify? Congressman Braley, we'll start with you. Well, the first thing you have to know is what's it going to cost those businesses to comply and what type of assistance you're going to provide to businesses that may have difficulty affording that cost. We know that E-Verify can be very helpful, and we know that we shouldn't be encouraging employers to hire people who are ineligible to be hired under the laws of this country because we need to promote respect for the rule of law. But the most important immigration challenge we face right now is comprehensive immigration reform. And that's why I support the bill that the Senate passed with overwhelming bipartisan support, 68 senators voted for it, that would strengthen our borders, add 20,000 new border patrol agents to the border to protect us and make us safer, and provide a legal pathway to citizenship for those who are in this country illegally by forcing them to admit they broke the law, pay a steep fine, go to the back of the line, and make sure that they're held accountable for breaking the law. Congressman Braley, wouldn't E-Verify fix a lot of those problems that you just mentioned? It won't fix the problems of what we do about all of the people who are here in this country and it won't solve the problems of all the employers who are struggling every day to deal with a workforce that is changing. We see that happening here in Iowa. So we do need to promote respect for the rule of law, and that's why expanding E-Verify because of its effectiveness is a good idea. 
Senator Ernst, would you support a bill requiring all businesses to use E-Verify? I do believe that's a step in the right direction, but we do need to look at the cost to employers and making sure that they are able to afford uh, this system and perhaps providing the supports necessary to get that in place for private employers. But there is a greater issue with immigration. And I spent time overseas when I was at Iowa State University on an ag exchange. And when I was staying on that collective farm in the Soviet Union, the leaders of the collective, all they wanted to do was not talk about agriculture issues, but talk about what it was to be an American, what it was like to be free and experience the type of opportunities that we have in America. So I understand why families want to come to the United States and experience that American dream. But we are a nation of immigrants and we are also a nation of laws. So we do need to enforce the existing laws, but I believe we also need to secure the border. That needs to be done first. I see it as more than just an immigration issue, but also one of, of national security. We've, we've had some lengthy questions here for you. I'm going to give you a real brief question now. Ms. Ernst, is there any scenario that you would support raising taxes on Iowa voters? No, I, I believe that we can find ways to make our government more efficient um, without raising taxes on our hardworking Iowans. I would like to see our Iowans keeping more of their tax dollars in their own pockets so that they can save for their children's college education, so they can pay their bills, so they can buy a home. All of those wonderful things that we would like to see Iowans do. Here in the state of Iowa, I implemented uh, one of the largest tax cuts with the leadership of Governor Terry Branstad. Matter of fact, it was the largest tax cut, and we are saving Iowans 4.4 billion dollars over the next 10 years. And this is just one part of our greater economic plan, which also includes reducing job killing rules and regulations and balancing the budget, which we have done here in Iowa for the past four years. Would you consider raising the cap on social security tax as a tax? It is an option that can be discussed out there, but I think we have better options that we can look at. Mr. Wheeler? Well, Senator Ernst may think that there are better options, but you gave her the opportunity to explain them tonight, and she didn't. And the thing that I will tell you is that right now one of our biggest problems is we provide tax incentives to corporations that ship U.S. jobs overseas. So I would eliminate those tax incentives, and that would cause the taxes for some of those corporations to go up, Tim. And I think most Iowa voters can accept that reality, because they want a tax system that is fair for people in the working class. Now, Senator Ernst has expressed support for a tax change to the way we currently tax people. She has expressed support for a 23% national sales tax that would dramatically increase the tax burden on working class families because it would be added to the existing 6% sales tax you pay, meaning that you would be paying almost 40% on every dollar you spend in sales taxes. And she has talked about that as an option she's willing to consider. I won't. He, he mentioned several points there. M Ms. Ernst, go I, ahead. I do believe that we need to lower taxes on our hardworking Iowans immediately. Immediately. Which is something that we have done with this tax cut that we have implemented here in Iowa. But then work over the long term to reform our tax system. I say scrap the IRS. Let's start all over over again, but we need a tax that is fairer, flatter, and simpler. So again, we do need to find an option, um, and I am willing to sit down. We need to have bipartisan support on this, but let's make life better for hardworking Americans. We can't tax them to death. And my opponent, Congressman Braley, that seems to be the answer for everything, is higher taxes and more spending. We can't keep doing that to our hardworking Iowans. Senator, Senator Ernst's answer to everything is scrap it. Scrap the IRS. Get rid of it. Get rid of the Department of Education. Get rid of the EPA. Get rid of the Clean Water Act. Um, every solution she has is throwing darts at the board 
trying to get rid of programs that have had significant impacts and made a difference in the lives of Iowans. So she wants to get the federal government out of the student loan business. What would that mean? It would mean 230,000 Iowans who depend on those student loans. By privatizing them, their interest rates would skyrocket and their lives would be much worse off. I don't think the solution to all these problems is to scrap things. I think the solution is to find problems, fix them, and to make sure that Iowans have clean water, clean air, and that they have the ability to get the educations that they deserve. So yes or no, would you raise tax? Excuse so me. So yes or no, would you raise the tax? I already, I already said that I think that employers who ship jobs overseas shouldn't get the tax benefits that they deserve, that they are getting right now, and their taxes would go up. Thank you. I Go Can ahead. I address that? Yes, when it comes to taxing and spending, I would say the congressman has made his positions very clear. Over the eight years that he has served in Congress, he has voted eight times to raise our national debt ceiling. The national debt has doubled in the time that he has been in Congress. This is immoral. We are passing on a debt to our children and grandchildren. Uh, my daughter's share of the national debt is $50,000. We can't keep spending the way we are. I don't believe in a bloated federal bureaucracy. We need to return a lot of that power to the states because Iowans know what's best. Iowans are working for Iowans. Our way is working. Washington, D.C. is not. Thank you both. Well, it's... Uh been a quick hour, I guess we could say here for some parts. Uh, we've had a pretty good discussion. We appreciate you joining us around the table tonight. Thank you for the answers to Thank our you. questions. And as we wind down this hour-long discussion, we wanted the candidates to share their closing thoughts with the viewers who are shaping their voting decisions as we speak. Mr. Braley, you had the first word. Ms. Ernst, you will have the last. So you can start with your closing thoughts, please. Thanks, Amanda. Congress isn't working right now. And part of the reason is because of partisan gridlock. And one of the reasons for that gridlock is people who aren't willing to work together to get things done. I'm a bridge builder, not a bridge build, not a bridge burner, and I have a proven record of working with Republicans to improve the lives of Iowans. Iowans have been blessed to have two senators over the last 30 years, Chuck Grassley and Tom Harkin, who even though they don't agree on, it in, on everything, have been able to put those differences aside to advance an agenda that's helpful to Iowa. As your next senator, I'm going to follow in Tom Harkin's footstep. I've worked with Chuck Grassley on things like protecting and preserving the renewable fuel standard. I've worked with Chuck Grassley to try to protect the wind energy tax credit, which has transformed the landscape of Iowa and created thousands of good paying jobs. As your next senator, I'm going to get up every morning thinking about what I can do to make your lives better. And I'm going to focus on economic policies that are going to strengthen the middle class because that's what Iowans have always depended upon, whether it's in agriculture, in education, in energy. Our economy has been based on hardworking Iowans who get up every day and do what's necessary to get the job done. As your senator, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to work hard to make sure that your lives are better. I'm here tonight to ask for your help, and I'm here tonight to ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ernst, your final thoughts. Yes, thank you so much to our host this evening. It has been a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Congressman, very much for joining me on the stage. Tonight, I think you have seen very clear differences in this race. I am not a Washington politician. I grew up on my family farm in southwest Iowa. I am a mother, I am a soldier, and I am an independent leader who cares very deeply about the nation that we are leaving our children and grandchildren. I don't support Congressman Braley's policies, President Barack Obama's policies of higher taxes, more spending, um, Obamacare, amnesty, the list goes on and on. Congressman Braley has a failed record in Washington, um, and because of that, he is running the most negative campaign that Iowans have ever seen. But I believe in the Iowa way. I believe Iowans know what's best for Iowa more than politics 
politicians in Washington. And if you trust me with your vote on November 4th, I will fight hard for middle class families so they have better paying jobs. I will work for the thousands of Iowans who are facing higher health care costs because of Obamacare. And I will protect Social Security and Medicare for our seniors because they have sacrificed so much that our families can reach for the American dream. And as your next United States Senator, I will fight Washington to change Washington to make sure more Americans can achieve that American dream. Again, thank you both for being with us tonight. Our political coverage does not stop after tonight's debates. We are going to be online, so go to weareiowa.com and siouxlandmatters.com for political coverage as we draw to less than 20 days to Election Day. And we thank those in the audience tonight here. We also thank you at home that have watched this evening. And you can continue to contribute by going to those websites and as we head towards Election Day. From Epley Auditorium here on the campus of Morningside College in Sioux City, Iowa. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.